Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Center in Rhapsody today. Uh, we have quite a few of you joining. Um, I did do a similar um, webinar a couple years ago, so I was actually surprised to see how many people have actually joined in for this one. So thank you. Um, so we are going to go over um, five topics um, to try to help you have a seamless workflow, troubles troubleshoot some issues, um, and be able to center our units with ease and predictability. So some of the things that we are going to go over today are five keys to centering success. So one of the first thing that you really need to know about is understanding your centering furnace and the kind of heating elements you have. Um, second thing is the importance of following the zirconia manufacturer's IFU. Um, ironically enough, um, a lot of times we don't do that. So, um, and there are some times when it's okay to stray from the IFU just a little bit. So we will also go over when is it okay to tweak the IFU. We'll also go over some zirconia options because we have some amazing products um, out there now much more than we had you know five or six years ago a lot of great options and some of those options are incredibly aesthetic <clears throat> and then we'll talk about what furnace and zirconia is right for your laboratory um, you do need to make sure that the furnace you're using is going to work with the zirconia that you also want to use so we're going to go ahead and um, a little bit about me um, i'm a real technician and a cbt in ceramics i've been doing this for a very long time um, about 24 years, I've been a CBT for 19 of those years. Um, I've managed a traditional um, production ceramic department. I've also managed milling cultures. Um, so I'm very familiar with both ends of the industry, um, being the customer and, and providing for the customer. And there's a lot of things that I've learned along the way. Um, I am currently, uh, is on materials and education manager. And basically, my passion is really just sharing what I've learned along the way. Um, on my journey, I was a, a traditional analog technician, so it was quite the journey to jump into digital quite some time ago. Um, and I just like to share. Um, I do travel uh, across the country from you know, different labs, visiting with customers, whether I'm just doing education or I'm there to troubleshoot, um, or just doing a check-in. So there's a lot that I do see out there, um, a lot of very common problems, and um, coming across those pro problems, not always having the answer, has obviously forced me to, to seek out a lot of um, resolutions. So it's really a great thing to be able to be out there, um, visit with my peers, collaborate, and, and get some great solutions. Um, so problems that really a lot of people have and maybe sometimes they don't talk about it. <clears throat> so the first thing that I really want to talk about are the kind of heating elements that you have out there. Um, there's basically two common heating elements. Uh, one is the MOSI 2 and that is a heating element that you would find in a Centra or Centra Plus furnace, other furnaces as well, um, but I'm not gonna list them all. Um, and then there's the silicone carbide heating element, which you might find in the Dukema. So they're both great heating elements. They're both fantastic furnaces. Um, they are the two that I'm most comfortable working with and that I run into most often. Um, but there are some differences in those heating elements and the furnaces that you really need to be aware of so that you're centering your product and getting predictable results. So a little comparison is the MOSI 2 elements, um, generally you'll find those in a furnace that you can um, center at a higher temp in. Uh, you know, you can go up to 1600, 1650 and it's gonna be okay. However, those elements do require purging. Um, they do collect um, some crystals and that can cause contamination. And it just happens during the life of the elements. It's just part of the process. So you can see on the left, 
you have some elements that are kind of a nice eggshell sheen and those are brand new, beautiful looking elements. And if you look over to the right, you can see that there's some uh, white speckly, almost like chalky looking appearance. And so that would be a visual indication um, that you need to purge. And I'll go over that purging process um, in another slide. Um, and then you have the silicone carbide. So typically you will find um, the silicone carbide in furnaces that will usually max out at about 1550 for a high temp. Um, but the great thing is they don't need purging. Um, you, some of the older furnaces, these heating elements won't go over 1530 which you know you want to think about because there's a lot of meconia that centers at a much higher temperature so um, that's just something to be aware of but most of the furnaces that we have available now uh, will go up to the 1550 1560 even if they have the silicone carbide and that's a pretty common high temp for most zirconians um, so the the silicone carbide elements to the left um, that's the picture i took straight out of a furnace we have here and those are in good condition. Um, there's no warping, there's uh, no major buildup. But if you look at the element to the right, you can see that there's a lot of um, bubbles and, and some growth on their crystal. I wanted to find a great picture because I, well, the first time I saw it, I was a little shocked, but they can actually grow rather large bubbles. Um, they look pretty, but they're a little alarming. Um, it's just something that happens when these elements go over their uh, really the recommended heating temp. You can force them to go higher, but it just breaks down the element a little quicker. And so if you ever see large bubbles, um, you can remove them with a soft brush and, and dust them away. Um, you don't have to be too alarmed. It's something that's naturally going to happen and you can clean it out, but it should set off an alert in your, your mind that maybe your program is a little too high for those heating elements and you'll end up shortening the life of the heating element. So we talked about purging for the uh, MOSI-2. And so what's actually happening is that quartz is um, building up on your element. And with each firing, the quartz will, will build up and build up. And about once a week, um, on average, you want to purge. You want to remove those elements, um, those, those quartz elements out of there. Um, so that it doesn't contaminate your zirconia. So over to the left um, is a basic purging program. And this is specifically for the Centra. This is an example. Um, if you have a different furnace, obviously I would recommend you read the manufacturer's um, instructions and follow their maintenance. But I just want to give you an example of, of what you would do. So, you know, you can use a an old white zirconia disc, break that up into pieces, put it into the, the tray, run that up. And so basically it's a slow ramp up. You are gonna ramp up to about 1600 Celsius, which on average is about 50 um, Celsius higher than your normal program. So you're burning up, you're heating those elements a little bit higher um, and burning off all of the quartz. So hold it for about four hours. Um, I have tried shorter programs um, in situations where there was a need to, to do a quick purge, but I do really recommend the four hours. Um, and so if you look at those three uh, large bridges at the bottom, those were milled all out of the same shade disc, and they were put in different furnaces. They were put in furnaces that had different levels of contamination in them. Um, and I was, I was with a customer trying to resolve their, their issues. And, you know, um, as technicians, we tend to blame the product or we'll say, you know, it's a bad disc or there's something wrong with this furnace. When in fact, it, it really isn't. Um, it's something that we're doing typically. Um, I'm a technician, so I know I've done these, you know, silly things we all have. So uh, obviously the, the bridge to the left is very yellow. That actually came out of an A2 disc, but that furnace was severely contaminated. Um, we went, ran purge programs in all three ovens. End of the day, customer had good results. So 
So this is how important maintenance of your furnace is. Um, you need predictable results. We, you know, to mill a large bridge and center it and to have it discolored is such not only a waste of time, but financially that's, you know, not very profitable for you. And of course, making, you know, your customer, the doctor, the patient unhappy because you're going to delay the case. So just doing a simple purge procedure once a week, or if you're not centering that much, maybe every other week, um, keep an eye on your elements and avoid this altogether. Avoid those remakes, um, the hassle and the frustration altogether. Um, and also you don't want to, you don't want to miss out on a great zirconia because you thought it wasn't good because your furnace wasn't in the right state before testing it. And I do see that a lot. Um, you can clearly see on the top photo to the right, that is a, a MOSI 2 element that has a lot of buildup on it. Uh, and again, on the bottom, that's what it really should look like. So if you can't quite see into the furnace, you can always take your cell phone and take a picture. Um, but you should, if you take the platform off, you should be able to look in there and um, see how your elements are doing. You can even come up with a, a purging program as long as you just keep an eye on it and kind of time it and, and see uh, how long before the crystals start to build up. And then you can, if you have a larger lab, you can create <clears throat> routine schedules where your technicians can sign off and you know that the maintenance is being done that needs to be done. So, um, so another thing that will affect your results of your zirconia is calibration. Calibration is incredibly important. So if you have ensured that your furnace is clean, it's purged, and you're still getting discoloration or units that are looking chalky, you're just not happy with the results, you know that it, it shouldn't look this way. Um, what you want to do is um, make sure that your furnace is calibrated. So from time to time, um, it seems like the oven gets a little cold. Um, if you, you know, have worked with a ceramic furnace, um, and, and you build and you fire your crowns, you kind of know right away if your, your furnace is, you know, going too hot or too cold by the look of, of your buildup when it comes out. Well, it's the same thing with the zirconia. Um, if you're getting really chalky results, but yet you follow the IFU and you know you shouldn't be getting that kind of result, it should be more translucent, more lifelike, um, then that is something also to look at. So you would buy some, uh, you would, reach out to the manufacturer or the support of whoever, whatever furnace you're using. They'll have very specific rings for you to use. Um, you cannot use just any old ring. Um, it does need to be specific to the furnace that you're using. And basically you fire that ring, you measure it when it comes out with calipers, and then whether you've been trained to um, alter your furnace to accommodate for the, the difference in firing temperatures, or the manufacturer can help you with that. But basically you go into the um, settings and you increase or decrease the settings on your calibration. Um, and that'll get you back to where you're supposed to be. Just because the screen on the furnace says you're firing at 1530, that doesn't really mean that that's what's happening inside the furnace. So that is also something to keep in mind. Typically, um, Um, sorry for that. So after going all over, over those things, um, talking about um, calibration and talking about purging, just think a moment and think about what kind of results are you getting? Um, have you tried zirconia in the past and you were unhappy with it, but you never really dug deeper to see, you know, did you handle it right? Was your furnace set up properly? Um, to center the zirconia. So, you know, you should be getting great results. You shouldn't, so the three crowns uh, at the top of the screen, obviously the first one, very opaque, not desirable at all. Um, the cloud in the middle got a little too much chroma. Um, and then you have the crown all the way to the right, which is, has chroma, but it also is nice vitality. So what are you getting? Um, 
if you are getting a Shotzi crown, then are you following the IFU? Is your high temp correct? Is your furnace calibrated? Um, chalkiness, really you wouldn't get that from contamination. You would see more of discoloration. So you would get uh, a crown that looks like it's fired correctly, but it's, it's probably a shade darker uh, than the desired result. And at the end, we will have questions and answers and you know anything that uh, I haven't gone over or you feel like you want a little more information on, we'll definitely talk about that at the end. Um, you can type in a question uh, and I'll see that. And uh, you can hop in and ask a question too during, but I might not see it because uh, I'm focused on the webinar. So following the IFU. It, I can't stress this enough. I know it sounds simple, um, but I go to a lot of places and the lab might have several different zirconians. So rather than creating a program specific to that zirconia, they kind of throw it in with others. Um, I understand the challenges if you only have one furnace and you don't have the time to put multiple um, products on their own individual programs, but no, you really are compromising your material. Uh, you know, if you have a zirconia that is supposed to center at 1450 and you're centering it at 1550 because you have another material that you want to put in with it, you know, you are changing um, the structure of that zirconia. You're weakening it if you center it higher than what you should. Uh, you're probably going to lose a lot of color. It's going to be much more translucent, lower in value, and it's not going to be as strong as it should. So, it's, I can't stress it enough. Yeah, you have to follow the IFU. If you don't have that option to do multiple firings, I think you just sort of need to reevaluate. Do you need a different furnace? Do you need a different kind of zirconia? Um, do you need zirconias that are very close in centering parameters so that you can work around that? Um, whatever you need to do, you, just, you really need to think about it and make the best decision, but definitely, Follow the IFU. Uh, it will come back to haunt you. You will have units that's fracturing or not looking the way that they should. So there are times when it's okay to stray from the IFU. So we don't want to be the mad scientist, which sometimes we like to do because it's fun. And, you know, that's great if it's not going to go in the patient's mouth and you just want to do some testing. However, you know, we are technicians. We are not the actual scientists. We're not the chemists that are making these materials. And they put a lot of time um, and effort into making sure these materials go out um, and the ISU is correct and we're going to get great results if we follow them. It is okay sometimes to, you know, stray just a little bit, okay? Um, and also it's okay to make a cycle slightly faster. And so we'll go a little deeper into that now. So adjusting your high temp. So I feel pretty comfortable going 10 to 20 degrees Celsius higher or lower when I want to change my results. Um, and this is, this is based on my experience and my opinion. Um, I have not seen any, you know, um, bad consequence from doing this. Um, and also when zirconia is tested and the IFU is, is created, it's created in a, a very controlled environment. And it's safe to say that laboratories are not going to be as tightly controlled. So there's this window of acceptability. Maybe your furnace is a little cold and instead of centering at 1530, you need to center at 1540. Um, you know, there's these little changes can make a dramatic difference uh, and really improve the product and get it to where you want it to be aesthetically without compromising the quality. So pretty comfortable at this point um, going 10 to 20 degrees higher or lower um, to get the result you want. So if you go higher, you're going to end up having a lower value because it's going to become more translucent and you're going to burn off some of the chroma. Whether it's appreciated or whether you're, you're hand dipping it or painting on the, the green state liquid, um, you're going to still, you're going to get the same effect. If you go uh, 10 to 20 degrees lower, you're going to have a little more chroma. 
uh, and it may be a little more opaque. So in the photo, I feel like the you can see it best with the C2. The crown on top um, was centered at the IFU, and I felt it was a little dark, and I wanted a little more vitality, a little more translucency. So I did. I went 20 degrees higher. I went to the 1550, and I got exactly what I wanted. Um, the body of the crown was slightly lighter. However, it was much easier to stain and glaze and have the incisal already there and not having to paint on the blue and white stain and make it look fake. And it was really simple just to warm up the gingival slightly. And, you know, it was a uh, monochromatic puck, so it was all one shade. But in the end, I ended up having a crown that looked multi-layered um, just by warming up the gingival a little and having that vitality in the incisal. So don't be afraid to go 10 to 20 degrees in either direction, depending on what you're looking for. Um, and what you're looking for is really, it's your standard, so that's individual to you and your laboratory and what your preference is. Um, another topic that comes up quite a bit is, I really need to do a fast cycle. How fast can I go? What can I put in there? Um, I need to do multiple firings a day, I only have one furnace. So, I again, I always recommend you go by the manufacturer's IFU. Um, they're gonna, they've done the testing. There are some zirconias that um, have been approved for fast centering and they look amazing. Um, just because your furnace can do it, doesn't mean you should. Um, you can do a fast center, uh, and if that material doesn't work well with a fast center, you're going to end up with a compromised result. You're going to end up with an opaque looking crown. Um, you might compromise the strength. So again, just make sure that the product you're using is approved for a fast centering cycle. Um, even if the material you're using is um, approved for a fast centering cycle, you're never going to want to fast center um, a large bridge or really thick units. So uh, this image I just received from a customer and, and I was trying to do some troubleshooting and I you know, they were having some shade issues and all of these units were centered together. Uh, they were all milled out of the same shade puck and I'm looking at it and all of the dark units are all the really thick ones. They're, you know, they're um, crowns over abutments or screw retained crowns or a large bridge or just really thick units. So, you know, I have no idea at this point, we're still doing some discovery, but you know, the question immediately popped into my head, okay, did this happen to go on a fast centering cycle and those thick units really didn't get the heat absorption that they needed? You know, the thinner ones did and they came out fine. So, you know, when you're seeing something like this, that's, you know, kind of an alert for you to say, hey, what's going on here? Um, again, it's not the product, it may be what we're doing with it. Uh, and it could be one simple little thing or you might not even know you're doing it or, um, maybe you're not the one doing the centering as the technician is. So it's really important to kind of dive in and, and look, at, look at everything one by one and evaluate what's going on. Um, a lot of people that I visit, they have the Central Plus and they don't know that the Central Plus has uh, programs between 200 and 250 that are actually fast centering programs where not only can you have a faster heat rate, uh, but the way that it cools uh, is more like a porcelain furnace, so it opens incrementally and allows the furnace to cool down a lot quicker. Um, obviously, we know that uh, thermal shock is the enemy of zirconia, so the furnace is going to open a very little bit at a time. Um, hold there, cool, open a little bit again, cool, hold. So it's not shocking it, but it is allowing it to cool a lot faster. And that will really eliminate um, a lot of uh, the sintering time. So some of the zirconias that I have personally used and I think are absolutely fantastic with uh, fast sintering are the Katana STML and the UTML. I don't think you can really tell the difference when you fast center it or if you, you used a regular program. Um, the Amangurabak, Xylid FX, the Multi FX looks amazing, and so does the Zerlux 16 Plus. Um, one nice thing about the Katana and the Zerlux, if you are using those two products together, which I think is a great combination, 
Um, I like to use the Zerlux 16 when I need something for strength, and then I, you know, the STML when I need a little more translucency, or the UTML uh, when I need a lot of translucency. Um, those do share a uh, fast centering cycle that works great. So in this instance, you can put them together and center them and not compromise your results. One thing to keep in mind is you never want to put more than 10 units in a tray. Um, and no large units, no bridges, no thick units, or you're not going to get um, a, a good outcome. You have to keep it to 10 units or under. Furnace and zirconia options for efficient workflow. So you may have a particular furnace, but you might like a zirconia that doesn't exactly work with that furnace. So we're going to explore furnace options and then zirconia options as well. So again, I have on here the Dekema and the Centra because, well, they're my two favorites um, and they're a little different because they have different heating elements. So I, I like to, to cover both of those. Um, so you will all have access to this webinar when it's done. So don't worry that you can't um, absorb all of this information right now or that you're gonna memorize everything here, but this is just some basic centering furnace information. Um, different furnaces, uh, what kind of elements they have, and what high temp they go to. It's good to hold on to this because then when you're selecting zirconia, you can say, oh, well, that's one that I can or cannot use based on you know, how high of a temp my, my furnace will go to. Most of the furnaces now, like I said earlier, will go to 1530, 1550, 1560, um, even if they do have the uh, silicone carbide elements. There are some older ones that don't go that high, and I caution you to be careful when selecting your zirconia, because if you have a furnace that only goes to 1530 and the IFU is 1550, you're not going to get the result um, that you want. Uh, on here, you can all, it'll also tell you if the, the furnace is able to do a fast program or not. So this is just some good information to have. And then, so now you have your, your furnace information, but how about zirconia? So we have so many options now. Um, and sometimes we have to decide between do we need strength or do we need translucency? So the higher the MPA, the higher the strength is going to be for that zirconia. So around 1150 to 1200 is uh, a zirconia that you're going to want to use for, you know, all on fours, screw retain bridges, uh, any time you're going to really need a lot of strength. Um, if you still need translucency and strength, you might need to do uh, a little bit of a cutback and layer some porcelain on there. But that's one thing you can't compromise on. You have to go by what are the strength needs over the aesthetic needs when choosing your zirconia. Um, the lower the MPA, the less strength it has, but the more translucency. It has more translucency because there's more um, yttria added to that. So that's why um, you get more translucency. So the Zerlox um, 16 plus, that fires at 1550. The Katana UTML and the STML, 1550. The Amangerbach Ceramil, that fires at 1450. So when you're thinking about zirconia combination, right, and being um, lean manufacturing and proficient and trying to get the most out of your furnace, you do want to pick zirconias that um, are going to center at very similar, if not identical, centering parameters. So for me, if, if I were to have my own lab and I was I had to choose zirconia. Um, you know, I would go one way or the other. Um, and all of these manufacturers give you options for high strength, for translucency, for a white disc, for multi-layered. So whatever, whatever your preference is, it's likely that the manufacturer will have a variety for you. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go and use the Amangerbach um, I'm not going to use a, a Katana or a Zerlux product in a furnace and try to mix it with 
you know, the Zerlocks, they're, they're very different sensory temperatures. So really, really important. Um, and again, it's something that I see very commonly um, throughout. And, you know, it's always, well, I only have one furnace, uh, so I have to. Um, and if you're doing it, you're definitely compromising the product's uh, aesthetic and, and the strength. So those are some things to think about there. So if you are thinking about getting a furnace or you're thinking about changing your zirconia, if you have a furnace and the high tap only goes to 1530, but the zirconia's IFU is 1550, again, you're going to have zirconia that's under fired by 20 Celsius. Um, and then the phone rings and I get the question, why is my zirconia opaque or why is the shade too dark? Well, because you have to follow the IFU. So I think I stress that quite a bit, but um, it's something that is disregarded quite a bit. So at the top um, is, you know, a, a disc that was centered at different temperatures, and you can see the difference. You can see um, its ideal temp is 1450, but if you go below the 1450, you can see that it gets dark, and then when it's severely underfired at 13, it's, it's pretty chalky. And then when you go in the other direction, when it's over-centered, um, it's supposed to be 1450 and you centered it at 1500. You can see you're losing chroma, starting to get a little lower in value, and then centered 100 degrees Celsius higher than it should. You can see it's, it's even lower um, in, in value and starting to get gray. And at this point, you're compromising the strength as well. Um, if this were a 1150 MPA disc, you know, you don't know what you've lowered the strength to. Maybe now it's 900 MPA. I'm not a scientist, so I, I don't have that number, but you are compromising the material. So, follow the IFU. So, after everything um, that we've gone over, and as you're reflecting on, you know, work that is coming out of, of your lab, um, with these simple little tips and tricks, um, you should be able to say, hey, maybe uh, I need to purge my furnace, or maybe I need to calibrate my furnace. Um, did I try a zirconia and I evaluated it incorrectly? Am I missing out on something great? Um, that's really um, something for you to think about. I know I wouldn't want to miss out on a great product. Um, I am a technician, I'm completely not in sales. So I really, when I'm sharing with you, I'm really sharing my, uh, my personal preferences and, and what I think is great. And I talk about products that I think are great. Um, and I definitely wouldn't want to miss out on, on a product if I thought um, it was amazing. So when I do do testing or I'm doing any R&D on a material, um, I have a very strict protocol. I make sure that the furnace is purged. I make sure that the furnace is calibrated. And then I will censor the unit. Um, and then I feel confident that I'm evaluating them properly and that the information that I'm sharing is correct as well. Um, and really, I mean, you know, these are really simple tips and tricks and things that often get missed. I don't know if like during the training, it's just so overwhelming and you forget or it didn't, um, wasn't gone over. But I do find from lab to lab, a lot of these things um, are not passed down and people are unaware and, and it's frustrating for them. Um, we don't have, you know, it's a, it's a unique industry. We're always seem to be on a time crunch. We don't have time for remakes or for figuring out, you know, what's happening. And so it's really nice to be able to, to have these tips and tricks and avoid the problems altogether. And um, that really concludes um, the webinar for today. And if you do have any questions, um, you know, please feel free to type them in and um, I will answer them. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question, you can certainly email me. Um, I put my email down here for you. It's just pam.hanneman at henryshine.com. So uh, I'm on the materials training and education team. So um, I answer these kinds of questions all, you know, all the time. And I love nothing more than to be able to help out. So please reach out to me if you need to. Um, I do travel a lot. So if I don't um, reply immediately, I will get back to you. But please um, definitely reach out if you have any questions. 
And I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I hope it was um, useful information um, and that you, you did get something out of it. And I thank all of you for attending. And next month, we'll have a couple more webinars. Um, I will have one on choosing um, the correct zirconia. Uh, so I hope to see you guys on that one as well. And I will hang out for a little more and see if you have um, any questions you'd like to ask. Apologize. Um, I did answer about the stain and glaze versus polishing. You always want to polish whether you're going to stain and glaze or not. Um, rough zirconia, whether you cover it with tons of stain and glaze and now it's smooth, that stain and glaze at some point is going to wear off and then you're still going to be left with a really rough crown. And that's going to cause the patient some damage to their natural dentition. So always rubber wheel, at least the occlusal surface. Uh, or any surface that's going to come in contact with the opposing. Once you have rubber wheeled it, um, you can give it a very, very light sandblast, not enough to make it coarse again, but just enough to break that surface tension with, with uh, the sheen so that you can actually stain and glaze it and not have your stain and glaze uh, run all over the place. Uh, that's something that I, I um, practice and I make sure that I do. It's really not good for the patient. Uh, to have rough zirconia in their mouth. And I'm not sure when I shut my audio off. So um, CE credits, yes, when you signed up, if you put in your CDT number, I will submit um, your credits to NBC for you. If you did not put your CDT number in, you can always email me and I'll make sure um, that I'm, that's taken care of for you. Um, how can you see a surface crack that is not visible to the eye? Um, usually if you hold the crown up to um, a light, you can see the crack. Uh, sometimes the cracks don't appear um, until the, the restoration has left your hand. Sometimes that crack happens in the patient's mouth. So thermal shock is the enemy of zirconia. Zirconia is very, very strong, but thermal shock, whether it's coming from being taken out of the furnace too quickly or whether you're grinding on it improperly can cause micro fractures. Um, sometimes uh, you can start the tiniest of fractures. It leaves your desk. It's perfectly fine. You contoured it. It looked great. And then the poor stain and glaze person gets it. They fire it, and then and the crack develops more, and they they have a broken bridge or you know um, a cracked crown. They didn't really cause it. It just kind of happened with them because the, the restoration couldn't take the stress of that additional thermal shock. Um, we put cracks in zirconia when we grind on it. So you need to use um, irrigation if you're using a high speed. You need to keep the crown cool. Um, and always, you know, if you're adding porcelain uh, to a restoration, it's a very slow heat rate up low heat rate down, and same thing with stain and glaze. Let it cool, don't rush it. Um, you're not really gonna save any time rushing it. You are risking a fracture. Um, but these are things that we'll, I'll also go over um, in the next webinar as well. So I have someone that has the um, Centra furnace. They have a Centra and three Centra pluses. And um, they were told that they don't have to calibrate. Honestly, you shouldn't have to, but it can happen. So pay attention to what's happening uh, with your unit. Be proactive. Um, and if you feel that something's off, if you have done the purging and you're still getting discoloration um, for units that are too dark, then you know it doesn't hurt um, to check your calibration. Uh, also with the Centra, make sure that um, they are plugged into their own um, assigned outlets. Uh, if you are running two furnaces, and I think this would go for pretty much any furnace, if you're running two furnaces um, from the same line, the electrical line, and I'm not an electrician, so I don't know all the verbiage, but, uh, and then you start them at the same time, they're actually fighting for power. Um, and one of them is going to get it and the other one isn't. And um, you could also have some firings that are not accurate because of that, because it isn't getting the power that it needs. 
Um, I do know from experience, one thing you can listen for is a humming in the back of the furnace if it's fighting to get the power that it needs. And I think um, that we were all set with questions. Um, and if I, for some reason, missed any, please um, email me. I'm, I'm more than happy um, to discuss really any issues that are going on. And even if it's one that I don't have an answer for, I still really appreciate it because that gives me the opportunity to dig in and troubleshoot and you know, add that to my toolbox and have a resolution uh, for the next time that comes up. So um, it's really great for me to be able to work with other technicians. I'm just one of you. I just happen to have the opportunity to travel, which I'm very grateful for because I meet some amazing people. Um, and as much as I'm training, I'm also learning. So it's collaborative, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, anytime that there's an opportunity to discuss, troubleshoot, or even if someone has um, some tips and tricks they wanna share, um, I think that that would be, that would be great. Uh, someone is asking me about the, uh, the calibration ring. Those should be placed in the furnace exactly where your units would be um, placed because you want um, to get the temperature of that, that position. You can even use a few different rings. So if you're using, say, a center plus and you have, you're putting in three trays at a time, I would put in three rings in the middle of each tray um, and put those in the furnace just like you would center your unit. And then that'll give you the most accurate result. So yeah, you don't want to just put it on the, the firing platform. You do want to put it in a tray. Exactly how you would fire your units is exactly how you um, would want to fire the calibration ring. One thing that I do want to, I kind of forgot to mention it um, during the webinar, but um, one very common question I get is my zirconia has white dots in it. Um, and for the longest time, I thought there was something wrong with the zirconia. Um, it isn't. It is actually um, the quartz falling off of your heating element, falling into your zirconia um, and burning into it. So then you go and you grind out that perfect little circle, that white opaque circle, and it's all airy and bubbly and there's like really no real material there. Um, if you're thinking like that's an air pocket or a defect in the material, it isn't. It's actually the crystals falling onto your zirconia, or it could also be crystals that have fallen into your tray and into your bead. And so when you lay your crowns in there or occlusal down, you're getting white spots on your occlusal tips. Um, or if it's an anterior, you're getting a spot on the facial or lingual. Um, so that's what's happening. So you want to purge um, and you want to change your beads if you're using beads. Um, beadless trays are great. Um, been using those for a while. Um, but yeah, you want to make sure everything's clean. And if you're seeing that kind of problem, it is directly related to purging. And if you purge, you will eliminate that problem. Um, bowls with lids versus open trays. So um, you should always use a tray, uh, a lid, especially if you are using shading liquid because that um, is going to keep some of the contaminants from getting onto your elements. What's happening is the acid in your shading liquid is corroding the elements. Um, so you want to keep them as clean as possible. Um, so yes, I do recommend a lid. If I'm putting three trays in, I will just put a lid on the top tray because the tray that's covering the bottom tray is acting as, as a lid. And I think that is it. And 
really, I'm very appreciative to all of you that um, took the time out of your day to, to listen to me talk about what I've learned along along the way. Um, again, it's my opinion based on, you know, um, what I've learned just doing the job and um, traveling around and just sharing, sharing and hoping it helps you out. So I'm going to end the webinar now. And again, please reach out if you need anything. And you all have a great day. Thank you.